We continue our readings through the book of Daniel in the Old Testament and our reflections uh, on the different sections as we go through. We're in Daniel chapter 6 tonight, perhaps the best known portion of the book, uh, Daniel in the Lion's Den. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom and over them three presidents of whom Daniel was one to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might not suffer loss, might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above the other presidents and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the presidents and the satraps brought, sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we, can, we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these presidents and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the, the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him and sleep fled from him. Then... At break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions, and he came near to the den where Daniel was. He cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. 
My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So far and no further the reading of God's holy and inerrant word that we know that by his spirit he will give understanding of it as we reflect on these verses shortly. Please open your Bibles with me at this familiar passage that we have read this evening, one that we, as I've said already, know in one sense through and through, but uh, as with any part of the Bible, no matter how often we come back, we cannot exhaust uh, the, the riches, the depth, the significance, the applications that flow from every portion of Scripture, no matter how well known it may be. But of course, the story of Daniel in the lion's den ranks Uh, in the top 10 best-known stories of the Old Testament, even for those who are unfamiliar with the Old Testament, they will almost certainly have come across Daniel somewhere in their life's journey, either it be in a school assembly or in an RE class. Somewhere they will have heard of this man, Daniel, and his extraordinary deliverance from the lions into whose den he was cast. But, of course, familiarity can be a dangerous thing. Uh, we, we, can, we can think we know a story so well that we don't bother to stop and think about it again and say, have I missed something? It, it's, it's invariably one of the challenges that preachers face um, for, for a, a preacher to, uh, to come to a passage that perhaps he, he learned, first of all, in, in Sunday school or perhaps even in, in, in his own home growing up being uh, read Bible stories each evening before he, he went to bed, that, that he can come to portions and, and, and his, his mind instinctively says, it says, I know this, I understand this, and I know what the key teaching points in it are. And then he stops and thinks, well, maybe I've missed something. And that's why practically every preacher will have multiple copies or, or multiple commentaries on, say, this, on the same book of the Bible. Some people walk into my study every so often and, and, and will ask me, why have you got, why have you got ten, 10 commentaries on the book of Daniel? Surely one's enough. And, and the answer is that, that, that the task of, church, of biblical interpretation is never a private task. It's a corporate task, that it's the church together that is called to engage in the task of not only reading the scriptures, but interpreting the scriptures and doing so in a way that is true to Christian orthodoxy. Um, and, and as that has happened, as I said, not so long ago, that um, as Jim Packer famously said about the teachings of John Calvin, even a pygmy standing on the shoulders of John Calvin can see further than he was able to see. And Calvin would have been the first to admit that. And so with any Bible scholar, um, that if this is, if this is the, the inscripturated word of the infinite eternal God, then it shouldn't surprise us that there, is, there are eternal dimensions to what God reveals here. And even whenever we find ourselves eventually in heaven, we, our minds will be blown away by all the things that we didn't notice, we didn't grasp, even though it was there under our noses. 
but we will have a heavenly father and an elder brother Jesus who will put their arms around us and say, don't worry. We, we promised you that when you finally came home, you would get the whole story. And it's wonderful to remind ourselves of that. Sometimes we treat the story lightly because we, we relegate it to the level of a Sunday school lesson uh, that tells us dare to be a Daniel, dare to be bold, dare to be courageous, um, dare to stand up uh, when it, when the, to the crowd whenever everybody else is going in a different direction. Or else we, we consign it to the realm of the fantastic and, and therefore the irrelevant. Um, we know that, that miracles um, were, were, not, were never intended to be the norm in the experience of God's people down through the ages. Uh, they weren't even the norm um, all the way through the period represented um, between Genesis 1 and the end of Revelation 22. Um, in that sweep of human history, um, the, the, the miracles were confined to certain times, certain eras when God was giving fresh revelation. God would speak a fresh word through the prophets and he would put his divine seal on it by the miracles and the wonders that he performed saying, I'm speaking again, listen up to what I have to say, write it down because this belongs in my written word. But of course, to do either of those things would be to miss the point entirely of what's going on in this passage. The most important key to understanding the significance of the events is found in Darius's response in the closing verses of this section, in verses 25 onwards, where this decree was to be issued throughout the entire royal dominion, that people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God he, is, he endures forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed and his dominion shall be to the end. Here, here's a pagan king and he's had an encounter with the God of Israel and he issues an edict through the largest empire, one of the largest empires the world has ever known, commanding his people everywhere, you pay attention to the God of Daniel revealed in Holy Scripture. This is the fourth such response from a king in these chapters that we've been working our way through in the first section of the book of Daniel. But what stands out most powerfully in Darius's response is the statement in verse 26, for he is the living God, the enduring forever, and his kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. Said at the outset of our studies in, in this Old Testament book, that one of the major themes in the book of Daniel is the clash of kingdoms. The clash of kingdoms, not merely the, the, um, the wars that are fought between the kingdoms of men. That was something that, that, this, that the succession of Babylonian emperors that we read of in this book were very much embroiled in. They were warrior kings. They had vast militias. Um, and, and they were feared throughout the world. And they went out and they waged war. And they conquered armies. And they annexed countries. It was kingdom, overwhelming kingdom. But they were merely the kingdoms of men. But one thing that comes out increasingly clearly in the book of Daniel is that behind the kingdoms of men, there is the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of Satan. And Satan is the one who is perpetually waging war against those who belong to the kingdom of heaven. And he will do everything in his limited scope and ability to, he knows he can never destroy the divine kingdom or destroy those who are God's people, but he can make their life a misery. And the book of Job is testimony, how, how he singled out the man who was known to be the most righteous man in all the earth at that time in terms of his spiritual conduct and his godly behavior. And he had to seek permission from God to test Job to see if Job, Job's behavior was contingent upon the blessings that God was giving him. And one by one, he was stripped of every benefit that God had provided. 
um, from home to possessions to, to farmland to his children all being killed in a single blow. Then his health being taken from him, his wife turning against him. His very friends who were supposed to be his comforters acted as though they were his enemies. And all of this in an attempt to bring this poor man down, to deny God, to curse him and to live. And yet Job remained faithful that the powers of the kingdom of heaven upheld him in the face of the powers of darkness that were assaulting him. So here, we are watching the ultimate superpowers of the cosmos slugging it out in the book of Daniel in successive bouts through one lifetime. The lifetime of Daniel, who saw kings come and saw kings go. But Daniel was given length of days that, saw, that proved the point that the kingdom of God is constantly overcoming the powers of darkness. And here's the final bite in this story. We, at the end of chapter 6 marks the end of the um, historical record of Daniel's interactions with the rulers of uh, those uh, Babylonian and, and Persian powers. Uh, and, and here's the, 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 the final bite. And the contender in God's corner is still on his feet. Whereas his, his opponents are on their fourth contender. Three kings down, Darius soon to go down, Daniel standing to the very end. And Daniel's, Darius' statement is a, a candid acknowledgement of God's supremacy. That he is king of kings and lord of lords, god of gods. None who begins to compare with him. He prefigures the great moment at the end of history. And we are told that every knee will bow before Jesus Christ and acknowledge him as the high king of heaven, as the one who has the name that has ab is above every name. And they will acknowledge him, even his enemies. Even on that day, Satan himself will grovel at the feet of King Jesus as he receives that final sentence of banishment to the abyss that he deserves from the judge of all the earth. And it's only when we, be, we read this, this chapter in, in light of that statement that we begin to realize what kingdom life looks like in three ways. First of all, we see it in terms of the challenge of kingdom life, verses 1 to 10. When we view the life of Daniel through the lens of this clash of kingdoms, um, several things come into sharper focus. First is the, um, as, as we appreciate the sheer intensity of this friction between God's rule and men's attempts to rule themselves and, and to govern in the way that they think is right, and the way God's people are caught in the middle. They're caught up in the friction between these two tectonic plates. You, know, you, you read of the San Andreas Fault there on the western seaboard of the Americas, um, and, and of course that, that fault line in the, 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 the crust of the earth is always moving. Um, and, and every so often there's a, a, an enormous um, explosion of power as a, as a major shift takes place suddenly. It caused the terrible Los Angeles earthquake uh, all those years ago that, that was disastrous in so many ways. Um, but there are spiritual tectonic plates where the kingdom of heaven is grazing against the kingdom of darkness. And, and at times it's just the constant grind, but there are other times when there are, there's just this explosion of wickedness where the devil rears his ugly head and manifests his destructive power in, 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 in terrible ways. And, and as you find God's people, like Daniel, caught up in all of this, there's, there's at least two ways in which this friction stands out. The first is quite simply Daniel's great age. We know from various clues elsewhere in the book of Daniel that he was probably around 84 years of age at this time. Uh, 84 is a fairly normal age for people to live to in, in 
this generation with all the, the wonders of modern medicine. And back in those days, living to the age 84 was an unusual thing. Um, there, there wasn't the kind of health care and, and um, uh, careful thought about diet and so on and so forth that would extend a person's life, li lifetime. But he was 84 years of age. And I lived a very, very active life. And he was still going strong. He was still growing strong. And far from things becoming quieter and easier for him at that stage of life, he was on the verge of facing the greatest test of, the, of his faith in his entire lifetime. You know, maybe whenever he was a 14-year-old, or it was one of those in, in those early years when he was first taken into exile, um, um, and, and he was told, you're going to be thrown into the den of lions. You can imagine him saying, bring him on. I can cope with lions. I can, I can sort them out. But an 84-year-old ending up in that situation. Yet far from um, being the kind of person that was... Uh, so Dan was, he was anything but the kind of person who, who was looking for trouble in terms of making life difficult for those around him. He, he was worthy of respect. He earned the respect even of the, the Babylonians um, and, and the, the kings that followed. And yet wherever he went, it seems as though trouble pursued him. The, 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 we find a hint of this in what lies behind this strange feature of his life um, in the next chapter with... with um, a reference to the one who would um, oppress, it's a word used, literally means to wear down, God's saints, chapter 7 and verse 25. It's um, a reference to the way in which they, uh, the devil is, is persistent in the way that he, he wages a war of attrition um, against God's people. Uh, if Jerry Adams is famous for anything... Uh, it was his repeated assertion during the 33 years of the Troubles that ours is a war of, att war of attrition. We will wear down the British government eventually. Um, they will never defeat us, um, but we will wear them down. Uh, and in many ways, he was proved true um, that they did wear down the British authorities with the passage of time and gained concessions that they never should have gained It isn't merely that there are many enemies of the gospel who seek to grind believers down, but there is one dark power who is behind them all. You see, to be in, in, the, in, in God's kingdom, to be a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, is to be, by definition, at odds with the prevailing spirit of the world that we live in. And, and we feel the friction of that right down to old age. That we never reach a point in this world where we can genuinely put our feet up by the far side and say, I'm at peace. Because it's impossible. Because as Christians, as members of the kingdom of God, we are misfits, mis misfits in the kingdom of this world. Yes, we live here as our temporary residence but we don't belong here and we find again and again whether it be from within our family if there are members of our family who are not believers or whether it be from neighbors or schoolmates or colleagues at work we find that again and again we are we are being ground down by the the constant ridiculing mockery prejudice against us simply because we dare to say we are Christians. Indeed, the amount of prejudice that is stirred just by saying I'm a Christian is, is increasingly alarming. The other thing that strikes us is where the friction arose for Daniel. It was because he was the very model of integrity and trustworthiness. Here's the kind of guy you would want to have in your administration because you could trust him. His word was his oath. Never once did he tell a lie. Never once did he betray the trust of those to whom he answered. Everything he did, he did to the highest standard. 
And that's what made him stand out amongst all the civil servants of whom he was a part. Yet when we look closer, we see why that was such a problem. Because the empire and its bureaucracy were riddled with corruption. Riddled with corruption. Sadly, we see it in so many uh, areas of, of local government these days and national government. There is corruption embedded in those who are entrusted with the duties of the civil service, with the duties of implementing what is, um, what is uh, decided by parliament, um, what is enacted in legislation by parliament, that often it's those who are charged with implementation that drag their feet and, and quietly slow down what the government tends, intends to bring in. And that was certainly the case in Daniel's day. And, and so the, the, the king was, was conscious of, of, um, of, of loss of, of, of resources from the treasury. Look at verse 2 in chapter 6 where it says um, that the, the, the appointment of, of this array of, of new governors, satraps and, and presidents, um, uh, of whom Daniel was one, so that, so that to whom these satraps should give account, so that the king might suffer no loss. The implication behind that statement is that the king was suffering losses, that he was hemorrhaging funds from the royal treasury. And he says, I need someone to get to the bottom of this for me. I need people I can trust to actually run this country with integrity. Daniel's colleagues were certainly economical with the truth, as they will go on to prove in verse 7, as they conduct a smear campa campaign against their colleague. So, so they, the light of his life that was so transparent and so straightforward made for major discomfort in the shadowy world of, of those among whom he was working. And of course, that foreshadows the even greater discomfort that came into the world in the person of Christ when he began his earthly ministry, when he stepped onto the public stage, that, that even though um, the Jews of the day had never heard anyone who preached like this with such authority, a man of such kindness, a man of such power, um, a, a man who was, was clearly more than just a man. And yet the people who were most offended by him were the religious parties of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because the righteousness and the integrity of the incarnate Christ exposed their lack of integrity and their duplicity as so-called spiritual leaders. In his own words, Jesus says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men have loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. If we're Christians, we shouldn't be surprised that the world is never going to be tripping over itself with joy to see the change that's come over our lives, that there will always be a, a degree of animosity towards us simply because we are Christians. But the challenge of the kingdom is that we might live honorably and faithfully with that tension and being true to our God and King. What about the cost of kingdom, kingdom life? Verses 11 to 16, it's clear from the life of Christ that the kingdom, kingdom life carries with it more than a challenge. It, it, it has its own peculiar cost. For, for Jesus, that was a literal cross that as the world tried to snuff out the light of his life once and for all, he would be nailed to a cross he would be put to death. Darkness would envelop the scene that day on Good Friday. But for, for his followers, as Jesus says, if anyone would follow, me, follow after me, let him take up his cross and follow after me. It it's it's characterizes the life of faith, that, that the, the moment that you declare as a Christian, you are stepping into a battle zone. You've crossed a line. You're no longer at one with those who once were your mates 
in a life of unbelief and godlessness, but now you are on the Lord's side. And it will come at a cost. It's a life that means sacrificing our own private and personal interests to the ultimate interests of God and his kingdom. And that's a challenge to all of us as, as Christians. Uh, because so often we, we, we see it as a kind of a bargaining arrangement. Lord, I'll give you so much of my life, but please don't interfere with other parts that I'm quite content with and I want to hang on to. Uh, we, are, we, are to we are to lay it all on the altar. We are to prepare to, to, to sing those words and mean it. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. The, some of you might remember the late Reverend W.J. McDowell, who was one of the, the, the legendary ministers of the EPC back in the day. But Mr. McDowell, who had such a wry sense of humor, used to tell his congregation, uh, when you sing those, the words of that hymn, you're lying. Because none of you do that. None of us do that. None of us are prepared to sing with without any qualification, take my life and let it be. That's part of the reason why I prayed for Radius International tonight. Whenever the student, whenever the missionaries are sent out by Radius International um, from Southern California to go to, mostly to Papua New Guinea and to the unreached people groups there, they're told to go as families and they're told you will not have a furlough for 11 years. You will be out there integrating completely with those societies becoming one with them in order that you might reach them. That is a sacrifice that few other missionary societies ask for. But the Lord is honoring that work and the gospel is spreading in those areas. But this fundamental tenet of discipleship doesn't sit easily with what many churches preach and what many Christians believe. They prefer the kind of faith in which God accommodates himself to us and not us to him. But again, as we look at Daniel, we see what it means in practice. It means resisting strong temptation to compromise just a little. You know, the, the, you know, the edict that was being proposed was bad, but it wasn't that bad. It was only for 30 days. And Daniel could easily have said, you know, I'll, I'll go underground for 30 days. I'll keep on praying, but I'll just make sure it happens in, in a place where nobody will see or nobody will know. But he didn't compromise. It didn't require prayer to be offered to Darius. He wasn't to pray to a statue or to an earthly king, simply that prayer be offered to no one else. So, so Daniel could simply have gone silent for 30 days. And he would have obeyed the edict, but he didn't. He wouldn't bend, and such was his character that those who were his enemies knew full well that he wouldn't bend. What's the only way we can catch this man out? What's the only thing we can be absolutely sure of? We can be absolutely sure that Daniel will be on his knees praying in a way that he can be seen at certain times of every day. And if we can get a law drawing up to target that one activity, we've got him. Add to that the fact that Daniel by this stage knew that the exile was almost over. He knew that the 70 years prophesied by Jeremiah was almost up. And he could easily have said, well, who's going to know? You know if, if, I, if I just go underground for, for this period of time, who, who's going to know? But he would not bend, and such was his character, that those who were his enemies took advantage of that. And even when he took the decision to ignore the ban, he could have continued praying in a way that wasn't so obvious. Close the windows, the wind, the shutters, and nobody will see. But still, he didn't hide. And more than that, he, he could have grumbled to God. So, Lord, why have you let this law be passed? You're the sovereign Lord of all the universe. Could you not have overruled in this case? But no, we are told that he gave thanks to God. That even in the face of this horrible legislation, he was praising God that he was still working out his purpose 
through what was happening. And that says a great deal about Daniel's perception about God and his kingdom, that he could trust God's wisdom and his ways, even though they are not his wisdom and, his, and Daniel's ways. You know, there's a huge temptation for us to bend just a little bit today as Christians. You know, let's just sort of tone down some of our language, or let's just withdraw a little bit into what happens behind closed doors as opposed to in public view. Sometimes even ostensibly for the sake of the gospel. Let's just try and make the gospel a little bit less demanding or less offensive. But if we really understand what the kingdom is and what that calling entails, then we will hold true. Because many dear people are still paying the price for faithfulness in blood. And let us not forget. Daniel knew full well that the same could have been true for him. That if he had just thought, well, I'm getting close to retirement age. I'll just slip into the, into the shadows and I'll enjoy my Persian pension for the days that remain. And, and I'll just go underground with my faith. But no, he held his head high for Christ and for the gospel to the very end. And yet when the time came, he, he didn't complain. He didn't rail against his persecutors, didn't call them names. But then, then again, there was someone else who was just the same. Did Jesus cry out when he was on trial? This is unjust. Did Jesus object when he was stripped naked and beaten shamefully by the Roman troops? No. While the nails were being driven into his hands and into his feet, did he, did he curse those who were doing this? No. But through it all, he was entrusting himself into his heavenly Father's hands for us, for our salvation. But then, then quickly, what about the outcome of kingdom life? Uh, how, how do you make sense of what happened in the lion's den that night? Well, obviously it was a miracle. It was something supernatural. But um, in saying that, we can so often cheapen what a miracle actually is, um, that it feels as though, well, God can do something special. He can intervene in a way that is miraculous, that defies the laws of nature. But the context doesn't allow us to read it that way. Remember, here are two kingdoms in collision, the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of God, and here's the drama of it all. So as Darius exper experiences the worst night of his life when he sees his own kingdom's power and authority for what it really is, he sees the ugly soul of a pagan government over which he was the head. And he couldn't sleep. He was conscience-stricken. He'd been taken for a fool. But what about Daniel? He was the one who was in the lion's den. If anyone who should have, should have had a sleepless night, it should have been Daniel. What did, what did Daniel do? He, he faced that night with tranquility. He may well have had a good night's sleep down there in that hole with those smelly animals crawling around him, growling at him. He may not have expected literal deliverance that night. He had no doubt, however, that God was capable of such a rescue if he chose to exercise one. But he also knew, as was true for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego facing the fiery furnace, if he chose not to, he knew that he was still one of the redeemed of the Lord and he would be safe in eternity. He understood that kingdom life is not just about this present world, but it has future prospects or the most, as the most important dimensions of the kingdom. And that shaped and molded everything about his life. He may well have remembered the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 11 verses 6 through 9, um, when it speaks of the day that would come when the wolf would lie down with the, the lamb, the lion would eat, ox like, or eat hay like the ox, um, that uh, the child would speak would, would play beside the cobra's nest and not be harmed. 
And of course, what Isaiah was, was glimpsing in advance there was the, the, the glorious peace of heaven. There'll be no dangerous place in the new heavens and the new earth. There'll be no, no place that has to be fenced off because the animals are, are too unpredictable for our little children to go and play with. Uh, and, and, and it's precisely what God did that night. That he lay down, Daniel, the Lamb of God, that they, they, one of God's children, lay down in the presence of some of the fiercest animals on earth, and they didn't, they didn't harm him. The promised experience of what God would bring in the future, he tasted that night in an unforgettable way. He didn't do this to say, well, this is the norm for what believers can expect down through the ages but rather to proclaim the hope of the promise of redemption. It's a promise to be believed because God has proved it again and again in miniature through instances like this to make a, a statement on, on a grand scale to the kings of the world at that day, at that time. But the flip side of that is seen in the fate of Daniel's enemies as being just as telling for those who refuse to believe that those who were bent on having Daniel killed, suddenly found role reversal. They were the ones who were being dragged, kicking and screaming to that hole in the ground and hurled with their families and their little children into that den where they were consumed by those beasts. So where does the cross of kingdom life lead for those who bear it? to the promise of a crown in the life to come. The day that we are called home to glory, if we die before Jesus Christ returns, the moment of our death, the cross we've carried as disciples of Christ in this world will be laid down. And the crown of righteousness that Paul speaks of as his own death draws near in 2 Timothy chapter, chapter 4 will be set upon our head. Well done, good and faithful servant. Daniel will find himself in a den of lions. Jesus in Luke chapter 10 tells his disciples, Christians will find themselves in a world of wolves, savage wolves. Our children, those who are believers, find themselves in schools surrounded by wolves those who are antagonistic to everything they stand for, those who will make their life difficult and increasingly so with all the legislation that is being brought in. But our Saviour Jesus Christ is just as much a king for us and for our children in our day as he was the Saviour King for Daniel in his. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that there in the den of lions, that terrible night, you were with Daniel, granting him peace. Thank you that by your spirit, you were supporting him and banishing fear from his heart. And thank you that you gave him that peace that passes all understanding. Grant that we too may know that peace as we dare to take our stand for you in the world that is against you. For in your dear name we pray. Amen.